Uh, thank you very much uh, to the organizers for the opportunity to present this paper, I mean, to discuss this very interesting paper um, by Christian. And uh, let me just start with some motivation. Oh, and a disclaimer that, you know, this, uh, this presentation is my views only, does not necessarily represent those of the Bank of England. Uh, just some quick motivation. I'm sure we all know that uh, the world economy has been hit by a number of supply shocks in recent years from wars, uh, pandemics, and energy. And um, looking forward, there's also the, the, grand, the green transition. And so let me start by saying that the questions that Christian's paper addresses are precisely the ones that policymakers want to answer. So in what I'm about to say, you can replace carbon price tax with energy price shock. And it's, it's, these are um, highly topical questions. So how do we model the transmission of a carbon price tax? How does the tax affect households versus firms? Which households will be affected and how? Which sectors will be affected? And finally, does this matter for aggregate dynamics? What are the implications for output and inflation? How long will this take for the tax to you know, affect domestic inflation and through what channels? And uh, as Christian mentioned, many empirical studies capture partial equilibrium or static effects. But the key message of this paper is that there are a number of opposing channels in general equilibrium that we need to model and quantify and also the transitional dynamics will also matter for the outcome. Um, I'm going to skip the model and just go through the mechanisms that the model tries to capture because I think Christian already did a very good job with explaining the model. So um, again, it tries to model the transitional dynamics of a permanent tax, $100 per ton of carbon, and it's multi-sector input output structure with segmented uh, factor markets. And a key thing is that Energy and capital are complementary inputs in production. And so what this buys us is that there's going to be a, sh a sharp fall in capital income as the net return on capital falls. And the distribution of labor income across uh, sectors will be affected. And uh, so in particular, activity slows in sectors that produce capital goods, and this is where labor income falls the most. There's also sectoral heterogeneity, um, which implies that there's a decline in output and employment varies across sectors, um, and it's related to the first bullet as well, that uh, sectors are linked through production network, and firms are therefore exposed to carbon tax or not only through their own emissions, but those of, um, indirectly, those of their intermediate goods. And, okay, uh, there's also household heterogeneity. <laughs> there's differences in exposure because of the consumption basket, employment, um, and shares of income de derived from uh, capital and labor. And so what this allows Christian to do is capture and decompose um, income versus expenditure channels. So expenditure refers to pass-through through output prices and income channel and transmission through their sector of employment and sources of income. And finally, the model captures transitional dynamics. So this putty clay feature, it's, it allows them to capture a very sensible demand function for energy. And so its capital stock is fixed in the short run, so energy demand is inelastic, but it becomes more sensitive over the long run. And um, as the net return on capital falls, there's a fall in investment and a change in the composition of investment towards um, more uh, energy efficient machines. So as you can tell, this is a very rich model. Um, and so why, why do we need such a rich model? Um, it's important to, car to model this you know, this transition very carefully because the conventional view is that carbon price tax is regressive, um, knowing that, uh, you know, due to the effects on the consumption basket, households may consume more um, energy efficient, energy intensive goods. But this paper actually shows that there are some channels um, that lead to, um, there are a number of opposing forces in general equilibrium, and there are some channels that might actually lead to a progressive effect of this tax. And so this model therefore allows us to properly quantify the fall in emissions, uh, consumption, um, GDP investment, and so forth. And what we find, what, what Christian finds at least is for the US, the tax is actually progressive in the short run. It's because high income households are more adversely affected um, because the tax is essentially a tax on, on capital services. So in the short run, the income channel, uh, the various income channels are progressive. So labor income falls, but this is concentrated in capital producing uh, sectors rather than carbon intensive. And on the sources of income, these high income earners also gain a larger share of their cap income from capital. Uh, low income households are also less likely to work in these uh, capital producing sectors and they're more likely to work in service oriented sectors. 
And so this is going to outweigh the regressive expenditure channel that most studies capture. So even though poor households consume more carbon intensive goods, there's actually a low pass through of the carbon tax into the output price, at least in the short run. Um, capital owners actually absorb the effect of the carbon tax in the beginning. But over time, uh, through this putty clay model, wages across the sectors adjust and capital stock becomes more energy efficient, so then the tax incidence uh, through the income distribution flattens out. And to put this in a bit of a broader context, it's related to many recent strands of the literature, um, you know, motivated by uh, recent events, so of course, you know, it's related to studies that look at the transmission of higher energy prices through the supply chain. It's also related to extensive literature on household heterogeneity. And most recently, papers looking at this um, look at which households bear the cost of higher inflation, which ones bear the cost of higher energy prices, and what does this mean for aggregate outcomes. And finally, it's also related to the literature on um, structural change, modeling various channels, and challenging the intuition if you model um, general equilibrium effects. So climate transition might not necessarily be inflationary. Globalization may have just um, you know, coincided with other disinflationary forces, and there's also evidence that fragmentation, trade fragmentation, may not be um, necessarily inflationary as well. So I just, I'll quickly go through the comments. Um, the first one I had was about the trajectory of the tax. So important assumption here is that the carbon tax is assumed to be permanent and immediate, and, and this is important for the transitional dynamics because a permanent increase in the tax leads to strong incentive to invest in these energy efficient machines. But how might these dynamics play out if the tax place, um, takes place further in the future? So I'm thinking of um, anticipation effects. Um, so how important is the assumption that it's unanticipated? Um, if the transition period is drawn out, uh, the fall in capital income will likely be less sharp, but do anticipation effects affect the speed of change in the, in the composition of the capital stock? And uh, what does this mean for households that consume out of permanent income? Um, also, what does this affect uh, on relative factor prices and aggregate demand? And so there's a recent paper of uh, Ferrari, Nisby, and Landy, and they find that um, although these taxes are inflationary, uh, the expectations of the tax increases in the future have a negative effect on demand in the current period. So this is a disinflationary counterweight. Um, another question that's related to the trajectory is how this would uh, differ with a gradual ratcheting up in energy prices. So the, the tax takes place um, incrementally. So it's, um, it's I, I understand that it's a very rich model and it makes it easier to study the transitional dynamics um, in the way it's modeled right now, but it's a slightly implausible scenario because consumer prices increase um, immediately and this prompts actions from a policymaker which leads to a recessionary effect and realistically it's just, it, it would be, um, it would not be, I think, uh, um, politically feasible to, to do this in, you know, unanticipated manner and in a large scale. But um, I understand the reasoning for it. It's already a very rich model. Um, the next the next one I had was about financial frictions and um, embedding you know, financial accelerator mechanism to study the macro uh, prudential implications of the carbon tax. So some sessions this morning already mentioned str um, stranded assets and it's just a natural extension given the importance of capital in this model. Um, so it's, uh, it's there's, uh, Galen and Lodrusso already do this for an oil price shock and you know, the first two bullets are already mechanisms that are in this model already. Um, just starting from the third one, it would be that the asset side of the bank's balance sheet depends on the price of capital, and so banks' financial position deteriorates. This leads to a disruption in borrowing and lending, which raises firms' borrowing costs um, through an increase in the credit, sp uh, credit spread. And this leads firms to reduce their demand for capital even further, invest less, and amplify the fall in activity. And, um, they show that this, this accelerator mechanism is already present in the data and it accounts for, it's one way of, uh, it's related to your decomposition showing that even though energy is a small part of production, um, it has large effects on GDP. So it's very important in production. Um, but so uh, one way, to, so this, this accelerator mechanism could be another, another explanation for that. Um, but it might also make this gradual ratcheting up of carbon taxes more, um, I think more, um, give it more 
uh, of a mechanism for it to have an effect on the economy because this may be already enough to induce financial stability, instability, yes. Um, okay. And on the, on the surface, it, it might seem that it's, uh, it would make it more progressive, make this tax more progressive, but there might be important spillover effects um, to capture and your model is rich enough to, to do that. Um, just go into some minor details about um, robustness to how production is nested. Um, so whether, you know, it's, I think the way that you have it now is probably the most plausible that energy and capital are complementary and then, um, but there might be also questions about how, um, if you have nested production functions, how it interacts with um, the complementarity with labor as well. Um, and uh, the richness of the model and the various channels it captures makes it really appropriate for policy analysis. Um, so this, this paper addresses like a, a positive question, what is the effect of a carbon tax and which households and which sectors drive aggregate dynamics? I think that's what your, your model can really answer, but given the distributional effects matter for the dynamics here, then how should, um, how should revenues be redistributed among sectors or households? And um, yeah, I just had a small question about Leon TF, but we can, we can discuss that bilaterally, but um, most interesting was the decompositions uh, in the paper. Um, but that's, that's pretty much all I had. I thought it was a really rich model, really insightful and a highly topical issue. And there are a lot of applications of this model from looking at, you know, even the past through recent supply shocks, but also looking forward to, um, you know, uh, fra trade fragmentation as well. Um, and yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.